I don't know why I always say his name like that. Saladar. So, uh, <laughs> I know. A Saladar. Join the team. Hey, this is the McGuire Review, and today we're going to be taking a look at Dead Throne. Let's lock in. Ready for the review. Dead Throne is going to be hitting Kickstarter very soon. By the time this video goes up, it's probably only going to be a couple days until this one hits. So let's hit some stats on this, because you may be looking at this and thinking, what is going on here? Look at this box, and we're going to get to this, because I think what makes this game really special is the fact of how this box is designed. Uh, obviously, the gameplay is cool, and there's some really fun mechanics, but it's really a first that I've seen that has a box that takes you know the cards and the gameplay into account, and it's integrated right into the box. Before we get there, again, Sharky Games is on this one. It is a, and it's right up here, one to seven. So you can solo this adventure game and upwards to seven players, which is really fun if you can build out a six or seven player game. And it's 30 to 90 minutes. And I always like these adventure games that give you that ability to get a quick play in, uh, but at the same time, you can play for an hour or an hour and a half if you have a lot of players. That's what's really going to range there with that with that you know that that play range from 30 to 90 minutes. If you got a couple players, you probably could play the game out 30 to 40 minutes. You're playing solo, you can do it in about 30 minutes. Uh, but if you are doing something where you've got six, seven people playing the game, you're probably going to go to that 90 minute mark. But it isn't like you're in for hours and hours. That's what I like about this one. It's got very straightforward, very uh, logical rule set, I like to call it. Uh, whenever you get into a certain situation, it just sort of plays out logically like you would think that it would, uh, without being bogged down with a bunch of complex rules to movement and combat. Those types of things are very, very simplistic. So let's hit some of the uh, items that we have here in front of us, and then we'll get into some of the gameplay here. So I'll start with the rule book. Again, everything that you see here is a prototype. This is a prototype edition of this game. It's all unproduction, non-finished items. So, you know, don't judge anything by the current artwork that are on these tiles, because this, this artwork that's on these prototype tiles actually has been vastly updated. And you'll see that on the Kickstarter site, that the artwork on these looks absolutely fantastic now. And I will say that the artwork that's already on a lot of the cards looks really good. And I really like the artwork that they have on these cards. They look awesome the way that they've gone about the various different regions that you'll go through and different types of cards you'll pick up when you're on different types of region tiles so dead throne rule book let's hit it here again it is prototype but you will see kind of what you're going to get which is going to be some real nice text laid out with color images of the cards and the various different things you're going to have to acquire as you go through the game uh, as well as the rule set. And I will say the rule set is laid out in a pretty good way as far as this book is concerned. There may be some more changes through the Kickstarter campaign, uh, but again, it's a pretty quick read. They do start off the rule book listing out some of the things that will happen over the course of gameplay, and then they'll get into what setup looks like and how to go through and play the game. Again, the game is very simple. We are going to go back and reference this rule book here in just a little bit when we talk about some of the different areas that we can run into. Bear, go ahead and hold that. Now, the first thing that we want to look at, I would say, are the characters. And I do have uh, three of them out here uh, for us. I've got Aaron. He is uh, one of the best smithies. Uh, in town, so he's going to be kind of a blacksmith type character, and every one of these characters is going to have, right at the bottom here, a fight and a defense uh, value. So for Aaron here, his base fight is two, and his base defense is three. And that's just, you know, unweaponed, just straight up dukes. That's what he's got as a base. Every character does come with a specialized skill, and you'll find that right here at the bottom. So for Aaron here, any weapon and shield that he has used is unbreakable by any means. So what all that means is within the game, you'll acquire various different items, and those items can be broke. Uh, when you go into combat and you do various different things, your items can break, uh, which then, you know, you can, you can fix them up later, but they can break, and that's going to be a problem for you if you're out on the road, especially if you're trying to, you know, get into battles with people to acquire either are stones or, and you'll see there's a stone right here, uh, or the pieces of the medallion. We'll talk more about how that works. That's really how this game balances. You're either going to try to get all these medallion pieces and win, or you're going to try to get these stones and win. There is one other way to win as well. We'll talk about that here in a second. 
That's how these character cards are going to work. Here's Aaron, uh, and we'll talk about what this is right here. It's a really awesome uh, player tray, I like to call it, that holds everything that you're going to use and acquire over the course of the game. We have Elena. That's an awesome character here, and she's kind of more of somewhat of a rogue character. Um, it says here in the description, she has a talent like no other. Her performance is stunned and amazed. Her viewers and escape artist by trade. There's nothing she can't escape from. And her skill is can reduce any level two or three trap by one level, can avoid any uh, th level three or lower enemy, uh, which is nice. And then on the back of each one of these cards, it will list out what that character starts the game with. Every character will start the game with a certain number of items. And then here's a couple items that she starts the game with, uh, and you'll find those uh, right here. Now, we will talk more about how these items work here just in a little bit. There are seven characters in the game, one of which is Salador. I don't know why I always say his name like that. Saladar. So, uh, <laughs> I know. A Saladar. One character will take on the form or the character Saladar, and the rest of the players will be various different heroes. And that's how this game does work. One player does always have to take on Saladar uh, and play him. Uh, unless you're playing solo, this game does have solo rules as well again it's a one to seven but there is a specific board here we'll look at that's right to uh, actually playing that game from a solo perspective because it's a little bit different they add in some questioning to accomplish uh, so that's a pretty cool mechanic as well so it plays a little different from a solo perspective than it would um, from a standard normal game with other players but one character is going to be the evil saladar which is the king's brother essentially you know this land here you have to acquire either the stones or saladar has to get all of these medallion pieces from the players and get to the castle and he can win where the players need to acquire all of these region stones you'll see more of them are here uh, from saladar and saladar kind of controls those stones over the course of play the players need to acquire all of those, or one of the players, and, and that one player needs to get back to the castle. There's another tile here that has a castle on it. There are more tiles here. I just have three of them set out for our example here to kind of look at how you would traverse around these tiles. But when you do play this game, you would have all of these tiles that we have here in the box. And there's quite a few more. You'd have you'd have all of these set up on the table. So your play space would be a pretty good size play space. And that's one thing that I do want to call out here with this particular title. Uh, and, and all of these things are in the size and the form that they would be from a production perspective as well. It's not oversized for just the prototype. This is the size of this game. It's the size of the box. And it's the size of these tiles that you would be kind of moving and traversing around. So they, these tiles are quite large. And it's just something to call out and know that if you're going to play this, especially if you're going to travel with this, you are going to need a little bit of a larger play area to be able to play this particular tile. Only because these tiles are, are you know, a little bit larger larger and it you know when i first started to get this I thought well you know they could have shrunk the tiles down it probably wouldn't have hurt anything um and it would have given you maybe you know a smaller space to be able to play with but but i actually like the big tiles it gives you this larger kind of sprawling area that you feel like you're exploring through and it does add thematically to the game so i think it i think it was good to go with the larger tiles and, it, and it's something a little different that you won't find uh, in most of these adventure board game titles like this, where they use the smaller hexagons or squares at that. So that's what those are going to be like. And let's get into this box, because this box is really fantastic. And they do have an inner insert here that will kind of house all the different components that you're going to need for the game. So you've got your health tokens over here, and you've got your uh, various type of money that's here and here and here. you got all your tiles, you got your player uh, boards that you have here. There's some pawn tokens that are back here. Now, through the Kickstarter, there will be some miniatures that are get unlocked. So hopefully, not only does the game get made, they get to that threshold for that uh, stretch goal, and they're able to unlock the miniatures because those miniatures are pretty cool, and they would add a nice thematic flavor to the game. I always like it when games have these miniatures versus, you know, the simple pawns. So I do hope they're able to unlock that through their Kickstarter, which is starting here very, very soon. And there'll be a link in the description below if you want to get to that. But when we look at this box, you'll see that all the different cards are located right here. And that's all the way from your quest cards 
to your trap cards, to all the different types of region cards. You do have quite a few different types of region cards here, and those will correlate to the region spots that are here. Like this is a stone region, and over here is kind of a forest region. So you'll, you'll see that those will correspond. There'll be a little name right down here under each one of those that will correspond to the image that's on these cards. And when you land on a spot within that area, you'll be able to go here and you'll draw from the bottom and you'll take one of those cards and you'll say, okay, what did I get? Well, you run into all kinds of different things. You may like this one, you ran into a merchant. So you'll get to interact with a merchant if you're able to draw that. You might run into an individual quest, I like to call it, where you know there's quests that are cycled into these as well, which is really neat. What you'll find inside of each one of these decks are items, uh, much like items that you can acquire from the market if you go to a city. Here's a city here that's got a market you can go to it to acquire these items. We'll talk about that here in a second. There's also quests that are in here. Now, you can pick up more of what I like to call group quests where you'll go down here and you'll, you'll pick up a quest and you'll read it and you'll put it out and anybody can get that quest and acquire that quest. And you can acquire these quests by going to the tavern, which is right here. It's got a little beer sign out in front of it. If you go to the tavern, you can acquire quests that go out. Now, then any player can accomplish those quests over the course of play. But you can also pick up individualized quests by, you know, getting lucky and getting them in these decks that come out. And it will just be a quest that you'll, you'll lay down and you will just accomplish that quest over the course of the game. And then there's also going to be traps that you can pick up and put down. These traps are really cool. You can lay traps all over the board and people, you know, hit them. It's pretty funny. They get trapped by these traps. And I'll have to say the artwork on all these cards are really great. The artwork is just really cool on these cards. I, I really, really like the artwork. I think it's done very well. Again, the artwork on these really needs to be updated. And you'll see that in the Kickstarter. They have massively updated the artwork on these here. But the artwork on the cards is just absolutely fantastic. I really, really like the artwork on the cards. Um, so here's a quest here, and I'll just give you, a, give you a little taste of what this would be. So it says, I'm stuck in the ruins of Pale Cliffs. Bring me a teleport scroll that can teleport me somewhere else. Reward on the back. So you'll have that quest, and you'll put that quest down, and then you know anybody can kind of go on that quest, and you'll look for this Pale Cliffs, which... Which, yeah, it's actually right here. So I've actually got it out. That was a perfect example. Okay, nice work, Bear. So we got that area out, and we'll go to where it specifies. So it says, bring me a teleport scroll that can teleport me somewhere else. So you'll bring uh, a teleport scroll to, you know, the person in this area, and then you'll flip it over, and then all of a sudden you'll get the king shield if you're able to do that. And every one of these cards will kind of list out, you know, this has a defense of six, it's a level seven item. There's little there's little symbols on the sides of these cards, and you can look all those symbols up in the rule book, and you'll be able to see those there. Uh, you can buy this for 42 gold, and you can sell this for uh, 38 gold. And it has an, an ability there. When battling an enemy, you can absorb and deduct three of their attack to be used against it on your turn. And this is an enchanted item as well. It's got the little purple enchanted icon that's on there. And some of these items are enchanted, some of them are not but this one just happens to be enchanted and that's how uh, that quest is going to work so quests are very simple i do love these adventure games that add those quests in it's like another little extra thing to do to find uh, you know a better item because as you're kind of moving and traversing around the map uh, whenever it's your turn you're going to roll some dice you're going to traverse around the map and every time you stop and you land you kind of interact with that spot and depending on what kind of region you're in that's the type of card deck that you'll draw from to see what happens kind of the little mini encounter within that space and again it could be a quest it could be a, oh there's a merchant there or it could be an item that you just find it could be a beast or a monster that you have to fight uh, which is always fun but everybody's going to get something a little bit different and that's kind of fun with turn to turn to sort of watch like oh what's this person going to run into when it's someone else's turn so that's one aspect of this game where you're you're adventuring through this land and you're encountering every spot that you land on you're rolling you're moving that's kind of one aspect of the game is that adventure component that adventure piece uh where you're questing the other side of this game is sort of the PvP side, which I which I like because you don't always find the PvP integrated into these adventure type games. You're just sort of 
adventuring in, you know, if you happen to run into another player, you have the choice to be able to battle that player. Sometimes that other player doesn't get the choice. Sometimes they can say yay or nay. They want to battle you depending on what game you're playing. But this game actually forces the PvP aspect. And it's all about the battles. So what you'll find yourself doing is starting off the game and probably steering a little clear from other people and just trying to... Uh, I'll call it quote-unquote level up. You don't really level up per se in the game. You start to acquire more and more items and really kind of bulk up over the course of gameplay until you feel you know pretty confident to be able to go into combat with another player because you think maybe you can take them out. And the reason there is you can't win unless if you're a player you've acquired all of Salador's stones to be able to get back to the castle and win the game. And those stones Salador will start off with as many stones as there are players minus himself. So if we were playing a three-player game, Saladar would start off with two stones, and he would pick which stones he'd want to start off with. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Now, you want to look and acquire those items, and then you're going to get into that PvP to be able to either acquire the stones or Saladar will acquire the amulet pieces to be able to then win the game. So this game does force that PvP aspect, and it's very much a part of of this game you're going to be battling a lot and that gets a a lot of fun when you're kind of moving around the board and you've you've bulked up everybody's kind of bulking up on their stuff and then all of a sudden you just start to get a you know attacked by other players because they're trying to either acquire those stones or acquire those medallion pieces so as you're going for items you're going to find those on various spots you're also going to let's say you got into this area and you went to the market and you were looking to buy an item well that's where this butte comes into uh comes into effect where something like I've never seen all the cards well the rest of the cards outside of what you're going to acquire when you hit into the region areas are actually up into this box and there's two little finger holes here and you're you, you'd slide this down together right and I it's kind of hard for me in the position I'm in but maybe I can get this here um, you there we go so you you kind of slide that down and now all of a sudden the market is is open for business and you'll have here's all your your player uh cards right here all your different characters and these are all the different items that you can acquire in the game so if you were to buy a bronze shield or a sword or a gauntlets or a pair of boots or a ring and every character can hold up to a certain amount of these items and that's where this board right here comes into play is as you acquire items you'll set these on this board and you know right across the top here will be things that you'll sort of have equipped and in play and the cards are laying sort of sideways right here are the items that will be more from an armor perspective like your amulets and your armors and your boots and your rings and all of those things will sit right here and you can only have so many so you can have one two three four five different pieces of armor and then you can have three like equipped type things and then over here on these trays is where you will have your inventory and your what they call your sack or your sack so your inventory is going to hold, uh, you know, much like an inventory would work in any other game, some extra items, some extra things. Your sack, sack. is going to hold various different things you can have more access to over the course of, uh, of play. Sack. And those cards are just going to simply set right on those areas right there. But it's very nice to have this type of board when you're playing, and all of your cards are kind of out in front of you. Now, trap cards and scroll cards and those kind of things, you're going to kind of keep those sort of hidden amongst yourself so people won't know you have those. And I mentioned scrolls, and those are actually right here, these three decks that are out. And there's just three decks that are out in play. And as you uh, purchase scrolls, you can have up to eight of them in your hand. You can, you know, take cards from these decks here, and these will allow you to do various different things. At any point, you can use these on your turn. It says here, uh, teleport yourself from anywhere in the land to an inn. That's just an example. Let's look at another one here. Uh, heal yourself by five. Let's look at one in here. Um, enchant a shield. That shield becomes unbreakable by any means. So all these scrolls, and you'll just kind of draw one, and you'll get what you get. All these scrolls, will allow you to do different things that can improve the abilities of your weapons uh, they will help you in combat uh, and that's something that you know let's say someone has quite a few of these scrolls but they're not too beefy on the weapons and the armor but another character is really beefy on weapons and armor but doesn't have very many scrolls don't think just because you have better weapons than someone else that you're going to be able to rush in 
and just take them out because they might have scrolls in their hand that's really powerful that turn the tide of that battle when you're battling them for either a stone or a medallion piece. So you're going to have to kind of balance that and watch that as you play the game. But again, I really love that aspect of questing mixed with the forced PvP for the win. I will mention while we're on the win conditions, there is one other way to win this game, and there's a uh, very mystical, powerful dragon in this game. And if you're able to get to the dragon and defeat the dragon, the dragon is very difficult, but if you're able to defeat the dragon, you're able to gain the crown of the king. And if you have the crown of the king, that's another way that you can win. You can take that item directly to the castle and then win the game. If you ever feel in despair like you're never going to be able to win in hand-to-hand -hand combat with another character, you just keep, you know, not getting in a good spot or getting really good items or weapons to be able to make that win. And again, you know, if you don't feel like you're finding good items along the way, go out, stay away from players as much as you can, quest as much as you can, run into enemies. When you beat those enemies, you get gold, get back to your towns, go to the market, and try to beef up and buy some really good items with your gold. So again, there's lots of different options of being able to acquire good items over the course of play. All right, let's hit this right here really quick because these are the couple boards you're gonna have. They're very simple. This one here is used for solo play. And the reason why there's a couple different tracks here is there's various different quests that you're going to have when you do solo play. Uh, and it's in the book that you're going to kind of track yourself over the course of play with. Uh, and you don't basically you want to accomplish those before you die uh, in a solo game, which is going to be able to you know give you the win or not. Uh, and that's how this board will work. Again, solo play is a little bit different. There are a few different types of quests you'll go on, things you'll have to do. And you can pick kind of which one you want to do, which is fun, and, and it makes it a little bit different, gives you replayability. This board appears very simple, just tracks your health. There are two different types of tokens. The one that sort of looks like a diamond in this prototype edition is, is you use that to track what your max health can get up to. So as you gain armor and you gain different, different, you know, different things throughout the game, uh, you will be able to increase your max health. And then this square one is basically where your health currently is. So you can't ever go over your max, but you can go up to your max. Everybody does start at 10, and then that will fluctuate over the course of the game. And that's the only thing that this board is used for, is to track that health. I do have a couple cards here that lists out the uh, market items that are in the market, different parts. There's uh, torches, hammers, sacks, ropes, shovels. Uh, we've got uh, bear belt. Bear belt! There you go, buddy! Oh, that sucks. They probably... Oh. We're going to skip Bear Belt. There is a Minotaur Horn, Scrolls, Trap Pelt, Wolf Tooth, there we go, uh, Boar Tusk, Lion Pelt, Troll Toe. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are on here, various different parts, and the buy and sell values. And you'll need those parts, you know, with various different things, quests, things of that nature, items, things like that. So, that's what you use these for on the back here. It lists out all the main items and how much they cost as well. That's just what these cards are for, just kind of a quick little reference sheet on what you can buy that's in here. You do have health tokens that you can cash in to uh, give you your health back. We already hit the money and the coins. And then you do have these large dice that you will use in the game. And you'll only use two of them to play. They do include four, and they will include four in the game. Those two extra ones are just so you know other another player can have uh, two dice if they need to. That's really going to come into the most play. Uh, when you have a lot of players playing. <clears throat> so let me hit that really quick before we dive into uh, simply what gameplay is going to look like. And then I want to talk a little bit about some cool things you can do with these items as well. Because there's, there's something neat that kind of happens with them too. If you ever have four or more players playing this game, and a couple players get into a battle, the other players don't have to sort of wait on that. They can kind of continue to... to do their thing and traverse around the map and and do whatever they can come and join that battle they're gonna be they're gonna be up to seven people in a battle if you want to the whole every player playing the game can get into a big brawl if they want to and they can join that but they can kind of continue on doing their own thing and it keeps the game moving and i like that they did that if there's three or less players uh, then you would kind of wait and it would continue to kind of go around turn by turn by turn because once you sort of get into a battle it's not Okay, I go, you go, I go, you go. It's like, that person goes, the next person on the table goes, and okay, that may be the person that is in the battle. So it, every person will continue to kind of take their turn around the table. 
It's only when there's four more players is when other players can just kind of go off and sort of continue to do their thing while the battle is going on. And that just helps not bog down the game, which I think is a very smart design. But when you play the game, what you're essentially going to do is one player is going to be Saladar. Saladar! And then you have some other players and heroes. You're going to divvy out these medallion pieces amongst the heroes. So uh, you're just going to do that evenly. So if there's two other heroes, you got one, two, three, four, five, six of these pieces. Each hero gets three piece. Uh, if there is, you know, ever a number where there's extra, you just kind of discard that to the side and you only play with that many pieces. And once one player acquires all of those pieces, uh, what's that being Saladar? Because he's after the, he's after the pieces of this, this broken medallion here. Um, he's after that to get into the castle for the win. Once he acquires them, he can then go for the win. And he'll get those by battling players and defeating the player and then taking that from the player. And when you die, you, you don't... You're not dead and out of the game. You have to just sit out of the game for one game term, you know, one time around the table, and then you will respawn on the board and, and come back into the game. But it is pretty detrimental to die because you can lose all your gold, you can lose all your medallion pieces, and then you can lose items as well. So it, it is pretty hefty to actually die. So you do... You do want to engage in that PvP combat when you feel like you can defeat someone or you have a pretty good chance. Don't just run in and be like, ah, the, uh, the hell with it. I'm just going to battle this guy. You don't want to die if, if you don't have to. So I just, you know, I say that. Spend some time questing. Spend some time getting some gear where you feel kind of confident in being able to go in and combat somebody. Okay. Now, when Saladar starts off, we talked about kind of splitting up the the medallion pieces amongst the players. Depending on how many players there are, minus Saladar, you're going to go here and you're going to get these uh, region stones. And there are six of them here, and they're different colors. The blue go with water tiles, the red go with stone tiles, and the green go with forest-based tiles. They do kind of go in that, uh, well, in the reverse order. So... The forest tiles are a little easier than the water tiles, and the hardest type of monsters and tiles are going to be these stone areas. So if you really want to have some decent gear before you get into the stone areas, because they're going to have a little bit of a harder fight when you get to these various different spots. So the, so the game does scale as well, depending on what type of region you're in. Uh, some of them are a little harder than others. But these colors correspond to those regions as well. And Saladar is going to choose what he wants to do with his starting region stones that he controls. Uh, and that's all the stones that are going to be in the game. It's however many of those players. So the rest of these are kind of going to be you know, disregarded. Uh, these are going to be the ones that will be used for the game. And he can either hold on to these or he can place them. Now he has to place a minimum of one of them. And once he does, let's say he placed this green one right here. Um... It would be activated in that region on that on that part of the region, that little step there they call it. And every stone that Saladar has activated on a region gives him an automatic plus two on his max health. So let's say he was the blue player here. He'd start the game already on 12, uh, where everybody else was on uh, 10 as a max. He'd already have 12 life. So you can see... Saladar is a character that is designed to be a little bit more powerful than the players because obviously, you know, he's 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 not he's sort of against all the players because he's going to be attacking only other players to be able to gain these medallion pieces. So he does have a little bit of a disadvantage because all the players are always going to be targeting Saladar because they're going to be trying to get his stones. They can have as many of these medallions as they want that's not the, it's not going to win the game for them they got to have these stones so all the players are going to be targeting from a pvp perspective our friend here saladar so he is a little bit more powerful than i would say than the other heroes where he gets the bonus health for every one of these stones that he's activated he can also hang on to these stones and not activate them because maybe he wants to traverse around and then all of a sudden he'll activate it later uh, giving himself a little bit of a health boost he can use these stones to teleport immediately from from region to region that have these activated stones so saladar can kind of he can kind of move around the map very quickly which is very beneficial and that may be when you want to pick these up like 
You may be here. You may have been here teleported over here, and now you want to pick this stone up, do some exploring, traverse, and maybe drop it over on a tile that, you know, let's say imaginary we had everything built out and there was another tile over here. He might want to drop that over here because at some point he wants to teleport between these two spots for one reason or the other. It might be a completing a quest. It might be he just wants to move from those two regions very quickly for one reason or the other. So he'll have that ability to be able to teleport. That's one bonus that he'll have. He'll start off the game with some of these nasty little traps, which are very powerful and really can screw other players over. And he also will get the bonus health for every one of these stones that's activated on a region. Now, as soon as he unactivates that or picks it up, he will then lose that bonus of health. So it's not like it stays. So if he was to say this one, he started off the game and this one he had just in his possession still, and this one he had activated. And for some reason he, you know, got his way over there. Um, and there's different ways to get, right? You, you can just kind of cross per steps. There's Sometimes there's these little things called quick paths that just kind of allow you to go, you know, multiple sort of spots from one area to the other. Let's say he made his way over here and then decided to pick that up uh, because he wanted to pick it up and relocate it somewhere else. He then would lose that health and it would go back down to the standard, you know, wherever he was. He would just lose two of his max health. So that's how that kind of works. That's how these stones work over the course of the game, which is a nice little mechanic as well because Saladar is constantly managing what he wants to do with these stones and where he's putting them. And at the same time, he's trying to protect them because wherever they're sitting and activated, you know, as a, if a player gets to that stone, they can then interact with that spot and then try to pick up that stone and then gain that stone. And then, oh, now, now all of a sudden Saladar has got to battle him and try to kill him to get it back and take it back from him. So... That's, you know, that can be uh, very dangerous as well, just leaving these stones laying out there. So you're, you're constantly managing, watching the stones, where they're at, teleporting back and forth between areas. So I, I would say, you know, you need to kind of know what you're doing if you're going to play Saladar. I would say probably a, a player that is more, uh, if you're new to this game, I would recommend by playing one of the heroes versus coming in brand new and saying, oh, I'll be Saladar, because... You, you kind of have to learn his mechanics and, and learn how to strategically sort of position the stones and move around the map uh, and combat other players and be able to protect those stones. Uh, and that may be a little hard for someone that's brand new to the game. So I, I definitely recommend if it's the first time you play, stick with a hero and have someone that maybe owns the game or has played in the game before, go with Saladar until so you can kind of understand how that character works. Now, there is something about items that I did want to hit, uh, and then we'll talk about you know, combat and movement, because it is very, very, very simple. So with items, you can have an item that just, like this, like this bronze dagger, right? Well, on this card, it, it again will show you all that, how much damage does it do, uh, what item level is it, uh, how much can you buy and sell it for, It'll tell you if it's enchanted, it'll tell you kind of what it does, if it's a special enchanted item. But it also will list a few things down here. Bear, load up the video. It'll load a few things down here, and Bear's kind of taking a look at the overview of some of these components as well as these cards. So you just watch that video and check that out. Bear always does a great job with that. Nice job, buddy. But down here it will show uh, thin rope, rope, and uh, all nets. And you think, well, I wonder what that is, right? thin rope rope and nets on this dagger well you can pick up other items over the course of the game like here i have a strong rope you can combine items and that's kind of the uh, i would say the the uh, crafting component of this game where you'll have to find different various parts right we looked at a little bit earlier as well as other items and you can kind of put them together and then that one item acts as a, an attack and a defense item so it's going to give you kind of both of those benefits in in sort of Oh God. oh, God. That's going to give you both of those benefits in one item. So if we were to do that, it would it kind of would list off right here what the new attack and defense of that item becomes if you combine it with another. So let's say that I wanted to take my uh, strong rope here. And this is actually a thin rope is what it takes. What I have here is a strong rope. So this probably isn't the best example, but let's say this was a thin rope instead of a strong rope. That's just what this particular character starts with, Elena. Let's say it was a thin rope. I would combine it with my dagger, my bronze dagger that's also enchanted. And then now, instead of this bronze dagger doing two damage, it now does four damage. And it also offers me three more defense uh, on top of any other defense that, that I might have. So that's actually really good because 
now I have a very powerful bronze dagger by attaching that thin rope. And I don't know, maybe thematically that's like you're tying a rope to it and, and now you're like swinging that dagger with a rope or something. I mean, you know, I mean, you can kind of create uh, or imagine, uh, you know, imagine whatever you want there of how that's sort of working thematically. But that's how that works when you combine items. And there's all kinds of different items that you can combine. And every item will sort of list off. And they're the main items like... Um, let's go ahead and here's a sword here. Let's, let's look at that one. You can add a, uh, a strong rope to it or a silk rope for this sword. That just that particular sword there. Um, let's look at the, uh, the gaunt, the armors is what it is. Um, let's look at this hammer down here. So this hammer is more of considered an item and it does three damage can be used to repair one broken item. So if you do have a hammer, you can use this as a as a weapon as well as an item. You can repair your stuff, and I do recommend trying to pick up these hammers because then you can repair your broken items as they break. And then it also says if you put a thin rope on it, it then would do three damage, which is the same it does, but it would also give you a defense of four. So that's how these are going to work. We'll put that hammer back in our active uh, innovative market here that we have. I really do love that. It's just a great design. To just use the board to be part of the game and part of the experience. I've always I've always liked that when when companies kind of design into the game and they use the box as a component, whether it's like, you know, hey, here, just roll your dice in the box and the, and the box becomes a dice tray and they put some artwork in the box or, you know, use the box to store various coins or various things where they've kind of taken it one step further and used the box to actually be a major part of gameplay and and hold all of the stuff that you're going to need over the course of the game, whether it's the cards all up front here, they're out of the way, they're not on the table, because again, your, your tiles are going to take up quite a bit of space, and the whole market that's here. So that's how these items are going to work. You can also summon monsters when it's your turn, and when you go into combat, you can summon a beast, uh, if you have that, and that player would have to fight that beast before it could get to you. Or you could do something called combined attack, where you say, you know what, I'm going to take my fight, my item, and my summon beast's fight, and we're just going to both run in and throw a left hook together. And you add up all that, and that would be one big, powerful attack. And there's various different strategies on when you would want, because you may think, well, wouldn't I just want to go in and combine attack every time, because I would have that big attack. Well, maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe you want to combine attack. Maybe you want to step back and 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 kind of throw out the monster, let them deal with that first, and then kind of let that monster whittle them down a little bit, and then come in and combat with maybe a weapon or an item. Or, you know, maybe you got a special scroll in your hand that does something that's going to surprise them out of nowhere. So I don't want people to feel like combat is just because the combat is actually very simple. You just kind of compare numbers, right? Is my attack better than your defense? That's how much damage you take. It's that simple. There is no rolling of dice. There's no chance in combat. It literally is the cards and the scrolls and the items and the monsters that you summon and the, the various different things that you have that you've acquired. It's basically your numbers versus their numbers. You're just going to do a simple comparison of those numbers. Biggest number wins. The difference is how much damage you take. It's literally that simple. So combat does go very quickly. It's really just a strategy in how do I want to attack. We just talked about that, right? Is it a combined attack? Is it a is it putting some items together and making a, a better item? Is it uh, using scrolls very creatively and, and secretly? Is it putting traps down and, and catching characters in traps and dwindling their their health that way? That's how combat works. You just get on the same spot and you go at it. Okay. Movement, you're going to simply roll these two dice, whatever you get, same, I just rolled two threes, that doesn't really do anything extra for you if you get doubles, that just says, I got six spots to move, and you simply just one, two, three, four, five, six, right? You can move up to six, you can move three, you can move four, you can move one space if you want to, and you're going to use that to kind of traverse around the map. So movement is very simple, and you know, at first I thought, maybe combat should have had a little bit more complexity. Maybe movement should have had a little more complexity, but I think that's what I like about this game because it it simplifies those types of rules. The movement is incredibly simplified, the combat is incredibly simplified, and it's really about how you use your items. It's about going on that quest, enjoying the game flow and gameplay, 
and getting into that PvP when it's necessary, where where this game takes in that mechanic of you really have to do that for the win. You have to get into that PvP unless you're just going to say, you know what, I'm going to steer clear of people as much as I can, and I'm going to go for that dragon and try to get that crown and make that win. That's very difficult. Uh, but I've seen people do that where they, they just try to focus on going for the crown and not fiddling with anybody else on the board. But I think that's really part of the fun of this game is all that PvP combat. And and you know, you can just see it on people's faces once they get really good scrolls and they've got some monsters they can summon and they got good items. You can just see it on their faces. They're ready to get into battle and start to attack their buddies around the table to be able to acquire those stones or acquire those medallion pieces. All right, so that is Dead Throne. I think I've gone over pretty much everything in the game, the various different mechanics and why I like the game. Again, Kickstarter, it's going to be out there super soon, probably within a day of once you're seeing this video. The link will be in the description below. If it's not there right now, it's because it hasn't gone live. When it goes live, I will update the link uh, down there. You can find this game out on BoardGameGeek.com as well. There is a page that's been created for it. Sharky Games, nice job with this one. I really do think you guys have created a good, innovative adventure game. It's light, it's fun, it's available for all ages in my opinion. This is a very simple game to play and very, very fun. And it's got a good amount of replayability because of all the PvP interaction. And that's what I think really brings people back to the table time and time again. So team, if you see this one, go check it out. I highly suggest you back this game. We want to see this come to production and get our hands on this because it is going to be something that I think people are really going to like and have a lot of fun with. All right, so hit that like, click the subscribe below to join the team, ring the bell. This has been the McGuire Review, and we'll see you next time. Rollin' Chris!